Welcome to Redbeard Radio. I'm Brian Keith, and today we are talking about how to prepare your business for a liquidity event. Fancy way of saying sell your company. You might want to sell your company, but you definitely don't want to sell it for less than you could. And there's some things you can be doing now in advance, maybe long in advance, to get your company ready for that sale. To help us talk through this topic, we have Jeffrey Feldberg. Welcome to Redbeard Radio, Jeffrey. Hey, Brian. Absolute pleasure to be here. And hey, all you listeners out there in listener land, thanks so much. It, uh, looking very much forward to seeing what we can do together, Brian, to pay it forward, make a difference, and add some value and insights. Because as I say, when it comes to a liquidity event or an exit, how in the world do you master something you've never done before? Bit of a rhetorical question. Short answer is you can't unless you can surround yourself with the right people. So let's see what we can do, Brian. It's a real problem. As I look at the companies that I help build in my fractional COO service, and I see, yeah, what are we building here? Or the other companies that are part of my mastermind. And I think, well, are you building this thing to sell? And is there ever a reason to build a company not to sell it? Not whether you actually want to sell it or not, but the idea of building a system that is designed for sale. What's the use case to not do that? But you know what? We take a different vantage point at Deep Wealth with what we do. And by the way, everything I'm talking about today comes from the trenches. This is not theory for the classroom or the textbooks. These are strategies where I got knocked by a two by four too many times to count and learn my lesson or it worked out of the gates and for what didn't work, reverse engineer that. So at Deep Wealth with our nine step roadmap. And Brian, for your listeners who may not be familiar with us, this is the same system that had me say no to a seven-figure offer, create the system, and later said yes to a nine-figure offer. So quite a bit of difference there, a lot of zeros to our benefit with that. And our take on it is when you prepare your business, when you're preparing for growth, for higher profits, at the same time, you're also increasing the value, or some people will say the enterprise value of the business. So Brian, you tell me, you have a thriving and successful and profitable business, keep it today, keep it forever, sell it tomorrow. The choice is yours, but the point is you have a choice. Brian, one more thing I'll put in there. Most business owners don't realize that up to 90% of liquidity events fail. So think about all that time, that effort, that money. It's all for naught. It's wasted. So when it comes to your financial future, for most business owners, another stat for you, 90% of business owners their wealth is locked into the business. So in other words, the only way that they can get their financial freedom is having a successful sale. And unfortunately, the statistics left unchecked are not in our favor as business owners. What I want, Jeffrey, is I want freedom. And what that means to me is the ability to change my mind. That when I look at how many changes happened in the economy during my parents' lifetime, and they're both business owners. So I grew up, I never knew a time where my parents were not both business owners. And I look at the huge changes from the early 80s to today in the 2020s. And I think, what kind of changes will be showing up in the next 40 years? The idea that I absolutely want to keep control of both my businesses or any of the client businesses that I'm involved in. And that I know that in 2050, I will not want to make a different decision feels to me to be insane. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And Brian, back to your question, one of your original questions that started things off, the one thing that we can do, and Brian, let's check your ego at the door. I'm going to check my ego at the door because I failed this next question and it's only a yes or no. There's no buts or maybes or, well, let me tell you about it. And the question for everyone listening, does your business run without you? So in other words, if you were abducted by aliens and they're going to return you, but five years from now, are you coming back to a business that's better off than what you left it? Is there no business? at all. What's going on with that? And again, for most business owners, I was certainly in this camp. The business did not run without me. I was the sun, the moon, the earth, the stars, and even some businesses that are larger, they have a management team. Unfortunately, again, in that situation, the management team, they're lockstep. They can't make a decision without the permission of the business owner. So for all you listeners out there, if your business doesn't run without you, Brian, to your point, that's the first thing you can start doing to really get yourself out of the business so you can work on the business instead of in the business. And there you have choices. When you have a, a good management team that's running it day in, day out, perhaps you want to act like a board of advisors where you're just coming in from time to time, you're seeing what's going on, but the day-to-day -day is being handled by other people, talented people, smarter and better than we are as business owners, and they're doing their thing. It gives choice and choice is always powerful.
And if you could do that, Jeffrey, if you could do it, why not? What's the thing if you're heavily involved in the day to day, but you might want to make a different decision in the next 40 years? What's the reasoning to not build a business that is more self-sufficient? And I can tell you that one of my businesses in Redbeard Consulting, uh, it's based on like the main product there is outsourced COO work, where I'm not training COOs. It's you hire me to worry about your problems. And that is a very much a, there's only one of me and I have a particular mindset and skill set. And so I look at that and I say, well, do I really want to build that to sell it? That would be a really different business. Not as interesting. But then I look at another part of that company, the Redbeard Accelerator, which is a mastermind, two Zoom calls a week in a Slack channel. And yes, people are there because they're able to go interface with me uh, for relatively inexpensive. But it's also, I'm building a community that has certain standards and I have perspectives on things. And I have hundreds and hundreds of recordings of our calls where at some point I'm going to go hire some people to go look through those calls and start extracting. Here is the Brian Keith way of doing things, the Redbeard way of doing things. Go ahead and look for all the times we talked about how to subject line an email and build a course around that. And once you do that, you know, a hundred times, now suddenly you have something where that body of work can represent, here's how we do things. And then once you can hire some people to facilitate the weekly calls, oh, well, maybe now I could have something that I could either be less involved in, show up when I want to, or even potentially sell as this is the Redbeard way of doing things. Love what you're sharing and what your vision is of what you can do. And Absolutely behind you a thousand percent with that. Brian, in my experience, for a lot of business owners, what's holding them back and what's holding us back? I mean, we're all business owners on this call and everyone who's listening. Really, it's inertia because it's important, but it's not necessarily urgent. Well, I'll do it tomorrow. And tomorrow comes, well, you know, I'm, I'm really busy. We've got this fire going on here. I'll do it next week or next month. Some business owners even go so far as to say, well, you know what? When it's time to exit my business, I know who's going to buy my business. It's going to be my competition. And they have a management team, they have a president, they have a CEO. Why waste the time and money of putting in a management team, paying recruiting fees, having all those other expenses that go along with it when they're probably not going to use it anyways? What's the difference, Jeffrey, between inertia and opportunity cost? You know what? A great question. One in the same, you know, inertia, we just get caught up in our own tunnel vision. And if we could add opportunity cost, into our inertia thinking, the inertia, I suspect, would quickly dissipate. And it's like, what? This is costing me what to not do? Well, let me tell you what I'm doing. And then you can tell me, is this short-sighted or is this wise? Because it's impossible to tell on your own, right? I could, I just described, here's how I could format the Redbeard Accelerator in order to sell it slash be less involved in it or be involved when I want to be by freedom, right? And I laid out a plan and the plan is solid. It would work. Why don't I do it? because it is a higher ROI now and in the future to work on the sales process for my other company, where that's our weak spot in the lender training company, lendersonlinetraining.com, which I bought a year and a bit ago, building out the sales process, building out the sales team, getting the scripts written, all that much higher ROI across my lifetime than the accelerator. And also, and, and part of that, it's both more cash today, but it's also, we are the only player in that market. So if I do really good, if I deliver good customer service that is good anywhere else in the lending market. The banks are uh, somewhat backwards in technology, in what they're used to. Their trainings right now mostly suck. Like watch a webinar. Our training is fantastic. Our customer support is fantastic. So if I get our sales process up to where it is better than anything people have ever experienced, that ROI is huge and we can dominate the market. And there's tens of thousands of clients. On the marketing side, the Redbird Accelerator, yes, the content we have is good, but there's an infinite supply of masterminds and, and plenty of them have people that are way smarter than me in a variety of areas. So I can't own that market no matter what I do. I will never be Tony Robbins, does not exist, but I can own the market for a lender's training company. So I think about, well, it would be nice to go do the thing over here to go automate more of the accelerator, but my ROI is on the building the sales team for this other company. Do you think I'm being myopic or am I being a good judge of limited time and energy? Yeah, that's a great question. And change the names, change the circumstance, but it's the same story for most business owners. And Brian, from the outside looking in, and obviously this is the first I'm hearing of this and would love to get more details, but from the outside looking in and for the listeners, we're all in a, probably a similar situation of, you know, Brian, you're trying to answer to a few different taskmasters there. And are you becoming the jack of all trades, master of none? And so in other words, where the higher ROI is, where your time is better spent, 
there's a lot to be said for going all into there and not giving up the other initiative per se, but perhaps you can bring somebody in who can take it to market and maybe bring them in as a partner, have them invest in the business and have some skin in the game and do something with it. It's a smaller piece of what hopefully could be a bigger pie. And, you know, as you're talking about that, Brian, I'm thinking back to actually last week, a a mentoring call, a coaching call, very similar situation, very talented business owner, had a couple of businesses going and it's tough to choose. But once we choose and we say, okay, this is going to be my focus. This is all I'm going to be doing. That's it. I'm going to wake up, live it, breathe it, dream it, think it. That's when the results start to happen as opposed to, well, you know, I'll do a little bit here and then I'll do a little bit there. It doesn't work that way, at least in my experience with our time, our focus and our energy. There's only so much of that to go around. We want to make it count. Tell me this, Jeffrey, is having two businesses actually different than having one business that has two areas you could be focusing on? Or are they basically the same problem that I just fancy myself to have a more complex problem because they're legally two different entities. Because I look at the lender's training company, I think, yeah, the sales is obviously the main place to focus. But really, if I if that company is all I owned and that's all I was doing, well, there's the sales problem is the biggest problem. But really, the marketing problem is the second biggest problem. Then there's marketing the print materials better is the third biggest problem. So there's it's still a case of here's the top three areas and here's my estimated opportunity costs for each of these and my estimated ROI. But that problem of how do you focus on something And how do you identify this is where the results are? It seems like maybe it's the same problem, whether it's multiple businesses or within a single business. What do you think? Yeah, I'm going to differ on that one there, Brian, because for me, having one business with different opportunities for a market disruption or even different divisions, to me, that's still more efficient and more powerful than two or even three businesses, because likely you're going to have the same team in that one business. And, you know, truth be told, once you do something really well, you are world class in this one area. Not that it's on autopilot because we're always looking to change and keep up with the market and keep ahead of the market, but we have a lot of it down. We have our systems down. We have a rhythm. We have a flow that we can begin to look at other opportunities within that business with a lot of the same players. Yes, we'll be adding other players along the way, but there's still an element of the same players that we can create that momentum and keep it moving forward. And you know, a quick example of that is even my e-learning company, Brian, just to illustrate, we started with keeping the seats filled, technical support, hosting, course conversion, did that really well and had that mastered. We were the golden child. And then similar to what you have, we asked, okay, where's the next area for a market disruption? And there's a whole process to that, but we identified it. The same team worked on that solution. And even though it was two different markets of now filling the seats and then keeping the seats filled, there were synergies that we were able to leverage that if we had two different businesses doing two different things, and I've been in that situation, my success rate, I've had more failures there than successes compared to when I've just been focusing on one solution. Does that help you out? Yeah. I'm curious what your judgment is. How many, uh, because we're in a world where most of us have multiple projects. It's rare that a person has only one project at only one company nowadays. Do you think that cultural shift is preventing a lot of success? I do. And it's okay for a company to have multiple projects. If, firstly, those projects all in a big picture way feed into the vision and the mission. And here's the other important thing, that those projects are being led by the appropriate number of people and the right kind of people. So to use an expression we've all heard, you have the right people in the right seat on the right bus that they're all focusing on this as opposed to, you know, juggling multiple projects. So uh, you can be the proverbial janitor all the way up to the CEO of your company. Again, that's back to the scenario of jack of all trades, master of none. And you're really talking about opportunity costs. You're really holding yourself back. So multiple projects are okay as long as they're going towards that vision and that mission. And also, as long as there's the bandwidth through the right number of people with the proper talent and experience to move the dial. For people listening to this who are reflecting and thinking that they have more work to do on how they're focusing their energy, what do you do for them to help them move forward? Brian, you already gave the answer to that. And you are wise with the strategies and the wisdom that you're sharing. And that earlier you said, you know, I have these different opportunities, even within the same company, and even outside of that company, I have a few different companies. 
but where's the highest ROI? And, you know, I'm going to go back to a maxim that we have a deep wealth. We did not invent it. It would be nice if we did. But it's Pareto's law or the 80-20 rule, which states, you know, give or take, 20% of your activities are generating 80% of your outcome. And so for everyone listening, take a look at what you're doing. 80% of the success that you want, of your revenues, of your profits, where are those coming from? And as tough as it is, focus on those and drop the rest or put them on hold or put them off to the side and you can get to them later or maybe never, depending on what goes on. But let's start focusing on what we're doing right, that 20%. And as time goes on, maybe some things change and what used to be doing well isn't doing well. We are always top grading that. But the 2080, the 8020, whatever you'd like to call it, focus on that. And that's really where we should be as business owners to drive the business, our profits and our value. How I'm using the Pareto principle in my lenders online training company is the delivery of our services are amazing. Our staff is knowledgeable and incredible. So I mostly ignore things that are not related to the sales, how to improve the sales process. And I'd say 80% of my time on that company is spent in that just the sales process. Because, and I have to answer questions also because I, I own the business, so I got to deal with other stuff. But my focus is always okay, what am I doing this week to go improve that sales process, support the sales team, get more leads in their hands, do some research? And I'm willing to go deep in the weeds and go do LinkedIn research and go into the CRM and do all the little detail stuff that I want to outsource on any other topic to someone on the team. Just take care of the minutiae. But on the sales part, like, I will be down the minutiae, writing sales scripts doing all the detailed stuff because I know that that is the one thing is our capacity. We could probably have 10 X the number of students we have without having to hire any more staff. That's how efficient our team is. That's the environment we're in. So what we need to do is sell more. Yeah. I love what you're saying. And, you know, even to take it to the nth level here, perhaps you can take a look at, and one of the things that for all of us as business owners, we can benefit for a day or preferably even over 10 days or 15 days, even a month throughout the day, whatever you're doing, write it down. It could be pen and paper. It could be digital, whatever it is, write it down, how long it's taking. And then once you're done with that, look back at the end of the day and go through, okay, I'm going to categorize this. This was an admin thing. This was a strategic thing. This was a selling thing. And then for each of those activities, identify do I have to be doing this? Do I want to be doing this? Do I even like doing this? And Brian, I suspect that at the end of the period, whenever, you know, how long that would be for you, you take a look and I suspect there's things that you could offload that would free up some time, even if it was an hour a week. And I suspect it's probably more than that, a lot more than that, that you can then dive into to get that 10 X in those areas for the sales and the other areas to really move the dial for the company. Yeah, I have uh, when I bought this other company, it had about four people at it. It now has 10 people at it. And I spent the first year getting stuff on other people's plates away from the founder of the company and making it so that I could focus on the sales part. And I'm month 14 of owning the company and we just made great progress in all that. I I'd love to hear, Jeffrey, for people who are listening and they're thinking, okay, I need help doing all this stuff. What kind of services or coaching or consulting are you offering to people? Absolutely. You know, at Deep Wealth, we want to teach the fisher people how to fish. And this is through our nine-step roadmap. It's a 90-day system. This is the exact same system that I use with my e-learning business. I said no to the seven-figure offer, yes to the nine-figure offer. And so you go through this, you learn the strategies, the nine-step roadmap, you're immersed with other business owners, and you walk out of that. Again, how do you master a game that you've never played before? The rules are stacked against you. You don't even know the rules for that matter. So you go through that, you can master that. And we have other types of supporting services beyond that, but that's really where I would start. And for anyone that's interested, send an email to me directly. I speak to business owners. I have that privilege of speaking to business owners all day long. Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y at deepwealth.com, D-E-E-P-W-E-A-L-T-H.com. And would love to have a conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeffrey. For this conversation, it makes me think more about how am I really allocating both time and energy and even times of day, like the first hour of my day. I have five first hours in my day a week. How are 20 to 20 per month? How am I spending those? And is that really in line with where I perceive the long-term value to be? So thank you for being thought-provoking for me and for coming on the show. And I'll talk to you again soon. 
Absolutely. And as we like to say at Deep Wealth, please stay healthy and safe.